I'm embarking on a journey to learn and share interesting concepts at the intersection of artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and philosophy. If you get excited about this sort of stuff, grab a cup of coffee and settle in. This is an ambitious endeavor. I think I might raise more questions than offer answers in this first video of what I hope will be a series. I want to start with discussing interesting ideas about the human brain. This, as you can imagine, is the foundation, the central atom of human intelligence. We still don't understand how the brain actively learns all the different things that it does. The London-based company DeepMind has been trying to use games as a platform to build machines that can operate with agency in a rules-based environment. Games such as Go, Chess, StarCraft. Games are kind of microcosm of the outside world. That's why games were invented. That's why humans find it fun to play. But to build a machine that is as intelligent as an average three-year-old human who can learn to operate in a complex world such as ours is much harder. What goes on in the human brain and how can we apply that to machines? In high school, you probably learned about the structure of different parts of the brain. There is the hippocampus, the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, the brainstem, etc. Each one is responsible for a different area of cognition. Recent research has revealed a lot more. The part of the brain we didn't learn much about is the neocortex. The sheet-like outer covering of the brain, which is responsible for most higher level thinking, a larger amount of neocortex is associated with more evolved species. The neocortex is also the bulk of the brain, comprising 75% of its volume. Now, an interesting company to follow is Numenta that studies the neocortex. Numenta is a machine intelligence company. Its stated mission is to understand how the brain works and apply those principles of real intelligence to create intelligent machines. Most of what I discussed today is based on the recent findings by Numenta. Companies like DeepMind are doing analysis of their own around how the brain really works and trying to simulate different aspects of cognition. I will add source links in the description if you want to go down internet rabbit holes and are curious about where this stuff comes from. Here are some fascinating things about the brain that we now know. The first one is the battle between the old and the new, almost like a generational gap. The old brain is responsible for primitive desires such as survival, hunger, reproduction. And the new brain has enlightened objectives. So when you're trying to resist eating a piece of cake, for example, your old brain is still wired to store high number of calories and therefore it wants the cake. Whereas your new brain, which operates at a higher level of cognition, is able to assess that the delayed gratification of a lean, fit body is actually higher than the immediate pleasure of satisfying taste buds. There is a view that artificial intelligence can be dangerous, that machines will eventually become so far advanced and leave us out of the loop. Now, this tension between the old brain and the new brain might be a path to understanding that better. Which brings us to idea number two. Intelligence is by definition benign. Now, there are different definitions of intelligence that researchers at DeepMind, Numenta, MIT, etc. are proposing. The definition I like is by Numenta, the ability to understand and model a structure of the world. Now, when you add motivation in the form of the old brain, you now have a complex, unpredictable organism, i.e. human beings. Super intelligent humans are just as dangerous, if not more, than super intelligent machines which actually don't have the evolutionary baggage of survival at all costs, storing calories, spreading their gene, i.e. self-replication and the like. However, in the absence of motivators, you have yourself now an intelligent machine that isn't really going to do anything. It doesn't have a goal. Now, what motivators are right slash have the highest propensity to lead to a better world for everyone that we should build into machines? Now that leads us down a tree of philosophy and hopefully we can come back to that another time. I love how Jeff Hawkins puts it. He says, what's the algorithm of the brain? Just like Charles Darwin was trying to understand the algorithm of evolution, random variation, natural selection. The next big idea about the brain is the fact that it's a fundamentally distributed system. There is no mothership. In fact, it is distributed into thousands and thousands of mini brains. This is in fact detailed in the book A Thousand Brains by Jeff Hawkins, who's one of the co-founders of Numenta. The neocortex is made up of neocortical columns. Each neocortical column 
is fairly similar to the other. How do we then have a singular perception of the world? The fact that there is no mothership brings into question the idea of how do we make decisions then? How do we assess the world as a singular perception? A few neurons store visual perception, a few store auditory perception, some store the information about touch. How does it all come together then? And the answer to this really surprised me. It is through consensus or collaborative decision making. There's an exercise we did at INSEAD. Each person in the class had a list of facts. There was an objective, for example, how old is Mary or something like that, let's just say, right? And each person in the class was given a set of facts that was somewhat related to Mary and how old she was, but sometimes not. I had five facts. You might have five different facts of which two might overlap with mine. Somebody else might have a completely different set of five pieces of information or we need to as a group come together and make an assessment. How old is Mary? I might have information such as Mary's cousin is Walber and he's 35. Somebody else might have the information about Walberg went to high school in 1930. So you see, all of this information needs to come together and as a group, we then need to vote around how old is Mary. And the consensus leads to a certain decision. That's how the brain works. I think that's very cool. Prediction is an inherent quality of intelligence. Now the neocortex assesses the world and understands the structure of the world by making constant predictions. I have a map of the physical world in my brain that lets me understand how this coffee cup is going to feel when I touch it or how this mouse is going to feel when I touch it. And if it feels any different, then I update the model of my world. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, just look to your right. Maybe you notice that the coat you had hung this morning is no longer there. Somebody cleaned it up. Or maybe you noticed suddenly there's a cat on your bed and you are surprised because there is no cat that lives in your house. So then you start to notice the cat. You will only acknowledge or learn something if something is different than what you expected. Even before you moved, the neocortex built a prediction of what you are going to see. Model of the world of your surroundings that has already been stored in the brain. The moment there is anything in that structure that contradicts your prediction, that then raises a flag and that adapts your model. Now, prediction is a method to learn by self-correction. There was a book a few years ago that I picked up. It was called Prediction Machines and in fact said that humans are nothing but prediction machines. And I found that fascinating. And now when I read Jeff Hawkins and what Numenta has to say, it starts to make a whole lot of sense. Learning happens via movement. For me to have spatial orientation in the world, I need to build a reference frame or a grid which tells me the coordinates of where I am. And I build that model by physically moving. What's unique to humans is that we're able to do something similar as it relates to concepts. Learning is inherently about learning the structure of the world. And to learn something, you have to move through it. The physical world, of course, but even concepts, you have to move through it. I find this idea so enticing, right? Because for you to be able to fully learn a concept, you have to look at it from different directions. You have to travel the edges of that problem or the edges of that concept. The next one is related to how our brain is fallible. Language lets us experience something or learn about something that we haven't physically experienced. Think about other animals. Unless they have physically experienced an environment, they're unable to learn about it. However, through the gift of language and imagination, humans are actually able to learn about something sitting far away. So you and I are able to be convinced, hopefully, about the fact that the Earth is round. It means, of course, we are able to advance our knowledge at a faster rate and about many more things that are limited by our surrounding. It also means that we are fundamentally fallible. Your belief about the world can be different about my belief about the world. And that leads to serious problems when it comes to encoding or trying to replicate a certain view of the world in machines. Some say the origin of intelligence is related to mobility. Now this has implications in the world of AI, where we think about embodied intelligence and disembodied intelligence. Embodied intelligence is robots, where you actually have to physically build in a machine that can navigate and physically move around the world. Disembodied intelligence is like AlphaGo or AlphaZero. The machine is able to navigate a virtual world or a simulation. Now embodied intelligence learns at a much slower pace. You're restricted by how slowly or how fast one can actually move. Whereas in disembodied intelligence, you are restrained or constrained by computing power. 
I know we've just only scratched the surface. Hopefully you learned something new about how the brain works in this video and are excited to come back to join me on this learning journey. Thank you for watching.